Hi, welcome to the 222nd meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our regular monthly meetings. Tonight we have Dan Walsh, who will be giving us a talk on next generation container runtimes. I'd like to say, to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for continuing to provide this lovely space, and thank you to everyone here for taking the opportunity to join us tonight. Two Sigma is hiring Linux system engineers. You can sp speak to the folks in the back there if you're on the market. Makoto and Jay, Pavel as well. Tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Please silence your cell phones. Do not eat snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentation. As usual, we will be recording tonight's meeting and posting it on our YouTube channel within a few weeks. We'll get the link in the meetup.com meeting comments when it's ready. Please use the microphones for questions so you can be heard in the recording. We'd like to take a moment to thank all our sponsors past and present, including Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Uh, for the workshops, uh, please talk to Simo or Greg um, afterwards if you'd like to know more about them. Uh, we're always looking for any volunteers to help organize. Uh, they're happening at the NYU Silver Building, room 512, 32 Waverly Place. Uh, please check our meetup page for the next meeting. Uh, our next general meeting will be in January. Keep an eye out on their, our meetup page for that. After the presentation, we'll be heading to Cupping Room Cafe, 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here. We'll be going in groups. You don't have to remember the address. Uh, final reminder, silence your phones, put away loud wrappers, use the mics for questions at the end. Okay, on to the talk. Uh, Dan leads the Red Hat OpenShift Container Runtime Team. He has led the SE Linux project, concentrating on the application space and policy development. Now please welcome Dan Walsh, giving us Next Generation Container Runtimes. Okay, can everybody hear me in the back? All right, great. Um, so as I said, my name is Dan Walsh. I've been at Red Hat for 17 and a half years now, so I've been around um, a lot of that time. I work on security products, um, mainly on SE Linux, but lots and lots of other stuff in security, and I've actually been... Uh, because of SE Linux, we've been working on container technologies all the way back. Um, so uh, gonna, just a level set, uh, we're going to be talking about what I call uh, traditional container runtimes, uh, traditional uh, containers um, and Linux containers. Uh, so I just want to get everybody on the same plane. So a container is basically a process running on a Linux system that is isolated by one of, well, usually one of three things or all three things. Um, so uh, traditionally, containers, the, fir the first way people thought about containers was around resource constraints. So talking about the um, ability to control what a group of processes can do on a system, how much memory they can use, well, how much CPU, and really what you wanted to do is make sure that one group of processes weren't able to dominate the system over another group of processes. Google claims that they run more containers than anybody in the world, and what they were talking about is processes in, in, in uh, resource constraint. Uh, the thing we use in Linux to restrain processes um, is C groups, uh, control groups. Uh, control groups was introduced into the Linux kernel many years ago. It showed up in RHEL in RHEL 6. So RHEL 6, which was around 2008 time frame. So it's been around for 10 years now, C groups. The second thing you think about when you're talking about uh, controlling containers, uh, uh, groups of processes on the system, is security. So security has been built into Linux all the way back. So we're talking about things like separate UIDs. SE Linux came in in 2001. We're talking about dropped capabilities, Linux capabilities. That came in back in the 1990s. So a lot of the security stuff that we're basically controlling what a group of processes can do on a system has all been in Linux basically from the beginning, but really, really old stuff. The last thing that uh, containers... Um, a group of processes that we call in a container is a thing called namespaces. 
So we use namespaces to isolate processes. And what namespaces do is they give the processes that feel of virtualization, right? So virtual, <coughs> virtualization, and what we're really talking about here is the things like the PID namespace. As soon as a process goes into a PID namespace, it loses its view of all the other processes on the system. Okay, there's a network namespace, and you can put a network stack for a group of processes that's different from a, diff a different network stack. And we can control things like IP tables rules, and we can control um, uh, you know, the routing stack. And you can basically set up virtual private network between groups of processes. Um, there's another one called the mount namespace. The mount namespace allows me a process to basically choose um, to have its own mount table. So from that point on, anything it mounts is not seen by its parent process. All right, mount namespace. That was the first namespace used widely. Anybody care to guess when the mount namespace showed up? No, it wasn't there from the beginning, but uh, it showed up, well, again, we'll use it in terms of RHEL. It showed up in RHEL 5. It was actually added for SE Linux. So in an SE Linux system, we have the, uh, we not only do traditional SE Linux, but we also did a thing called uh, MLS, multi-level security. And what you needed is you needed a way for a process uh, user to log into a system at top secret. And then he would see his home directory, and that would be all top secret files. If he logged into the same system coming in from a network at secret, his home directory would only have secret files in it. So we wanted to have a, per a way to log into a system where you would see different level of uh, different files based on when you logged in, okay? And that was the mount namespace. So if I logged in, and, and it, there's a program called PAM mounts. It's a, a PAM module called PAM mounts. You can set it up so that it, it'll set up different home directories when you log into the system based on that. That was introduced in RHEL 5 in order to get MLS back in 2006. Okay, and of course, RHEL comes out two years after, two, three years after it got introduced into something like Fedora. So the, all the technology, most of the technology that is what we think of as modern day containers has been around forever. In RHEL 6 timeframe, I introduced the thing called the SE Linux Sandbox. It allows you to run desktop applications inside of a, what I call the sandbox. It uses C groups, resource constraints, it uses um, security, things like SE Linux to make sure that they don't break out, and it uses these namespaces to put, basically allow you to run two versions of Firefox, one that can only see the external network, one that can only see the internal network. Sadly, I was too stupid to call it containers and start a company called Docker to change the world, okay? But I introduced that in RHEL 6, so I was involved in containers basically for 10, maybe 12, how, depending on when you, you know, when we started using this stuff, we've been using this technology for a very, very long time. So today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the next generation of containers. Um, so, con and we're going to be talking. Obviously, I come from the security world, so we're going to be talking about security. Um, so, usually, if you've ever seen me talk before, I usually make you guys do stuff. Okay, I'm not just going to stand up here talk alone. So, at this point, it says please stand. Okay, any time, please read out loud all text in red. red. That was pathetic. Come on. Try it again. Red. red. All right. I promise to say container red registries with a Docker registry. I promise to say container images with a Docker registry. I promise to say Okay, so I've been on a, you know, uh, you should see what I do to anybody in Red Hat that sends out a message that says Docker containers. I usually go nuts. Uh, but uh, another talk, I'm not going to do it at this talk, but I've been doing a similar talk to this where every time I say the D word, I have to throw coins into my swear jar, uh, but I didn't bring the swear jar with me, although my wife, who's sitting in the back of the room, has a, put together a swear jar just for... Uh, one of the talks. But anyways, so we're going to try not to say the D word as much as possible. Um, so uh, about a year ago, uh, when I had given a different version of this talk, um, all of a sudden, well, actually it was nine months ago, I think now, um, I was just about to give the talk and I got a phone call. I was giving the talk the next morning and I got a phone call that Red Hat had acquired CoreOS and someone was asking about 
you know, that didn't even know we acquired CoreOS. Um, so we, <laughs> we basically took, uh, Core, CoreOS and Red Hat merged, uh, about a year ago. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is actually was, was triggered by CoreOS. So I'd like to give them credit. And this, a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff happened before Red Hat acquired them. Um, but because of CoreOS, we're able to do some of the technologies that we're going to be showing and uh, talking about and demoing today. So I, I talked about what a container is, um, but um, what really what the Docker uh, company did and Docker invented was this idea of a container image. Uh, and what they did was they created uh, a way of distributing software on the environment. So let's talk about what a container image is. A container image basically contains a thing called a root FS. A root FS is a directory that looks like root on a Linux system. Slash. Ordinarily, it has files in there like slash user slash temp slash run in a in a directory. Okay, so I take that directory and I put content into the directory, and I start pouring content in it, and then I tar it up. I use the tar utility to tar up the content in that directory. Then I create a JSON file, and the JSON file basically describes what's inside of the tarball, or what's inside of that. Yeah, rootfs. So it does things like what's the entry point to the application when I execute it? What environmental variables do I expect to be set when I'm running the container? Um, other things like what's the working directory? Uh, who is the maintainer? Some labels about what's going on inside of the container. So basically it describes um, sort of what's into the container. So now I take that tab all in the JSON file, I put them together. So that's basically what a container image is. They also introduced the concept of a layered container image. A layered container image is basically taking that root FS and installing new content in to on top of the existing root FS. Then I create a tarball of the differences between what's in the original root FS and what's in the new root FS. I tar that up. I create another JSON file with modifications of whatever I wanted in my new application based on the lower level application, and I tar the whole thing up. And that's what a container image is. Okay, so a container image is a layered container image, and I can keep on stacking those layers. So that's what a container image is. When Docker happened, we got all excited because after all these years, it was going to be this new way of shipping software, right? We've been shipping software in, in RPMs for 25 years now, right? And something fundamentally went wrong when Linux started is that we had two ways of shipping software. RPM happened and very quickly Debian happened. And what Debian did is they created their own format for shipping software. And so for the last 25 years, if you wanted to package software to run on a Linux system, you had to package it in two different formats. One for the Red Hat sort of world, which is you know things like Fedora, CentOS, um, Suzy's in, in the RPM world, but basically there's a whole bunch of distributions that live in that world, and then in the Debian world, which is Ubuntu and um, a bunch of other companies, but basically there's, there's two different distributions, two different ways of shipping software. When Docker happened, there was all of a sudden there was going to be one way to ship software, right? We had the sort of the standard image. I'm not going to call it a D image though. Okay, so there was an image. All of a sudden, CoreOS came along, and they had a different way of running containers. They had a thing called Rocket, okay? And Rocket came along, and basically CoreOS did not want to have one company control the standard for what is the container image. And to give you an idea why that would be a problem, all well, we have to look at is our new friends in the Linux world, Microsoft. The old Microsoft, the bad Microsoft, every time they released, they changed .doc, right? And every single time there was a new, you know, Microsoft XP and whatever, there was a brand new version of .doc. And all of a sudden, anybody that was working with the old version of the .doc got these .docs in emails, and they couldn't look at them. They couldn't read them. So they had to upgrade their software or they had to buy new software from Microsoft. And things like LibreOffice and other tools that were trying to be able to look at these .doc would get broken all the time. So we didn't want to have one company control the standard for what is the new way of shipping software. So CoreOS decided to put out a standard. And they created a standard called the AppC spec, Application Container Specification. When that came out, all of a sudden we had two ways of shipping software. We're back in the Debian and RPM world. <laughs> 
And in my, my brain at that point was ready to explode because this was a horrible thing to have happen, right? So all the companies that were working in containers at the time, all the big wigs got together and said, no, we have to have a standards body in front of this. I'm talking Google, Microsoft, IBM, Red Hat, CoreOS, perhaps there's only one of those companies left, uh, and um, Docker, um, and I forget, there's two or three other companies were all involved. And they created a thing called OCI, Open Container Initiative. So what we want to look at now is when I want to run a container, what's the first thing I need to have is I have to be able to identify what the hell a container application is. And that's OCI image bundle format was standardized a year ago. So a year ago, last uh, I think it was December or January, they actually came out with the standard of what the image format was. And that basically said, this is the root FS, and it described the fields inside of the JSON file. That's all it is. Defi define what those fields are. So now we have everybody in the world has agreed on what an OCI image or what a container image is. So we can call them OCI images or just call them container images, but it's a standard now. So when I want to run a container, I have to define that OCI image. The next thing I need to do is, oh, segue. We need the ability to pull the image. So anybody here ever hear of Scopio? Okay, one or two people. One person was an intern for me a couple of years ago. Uh, so he doesn't really qualify. Uh, so Scopio. Scopio is actually very well used in the industry right now. Uh, but a little history on Scopio. We wanted to, basically, we opened up a pull request to Docker to do Docker inspect dash dash remote. And what we wanted to do is just to pull down that JSON file. Those images can get up to 1.5 gigabytes. I've seen them as large as. So when you wanted to inspect, if you wanted to just look at that JSON, the only way to do it was to do a Docker pull and then a Docker inspect. Okay, so you had to pull the 1.5 gigabytes and then realize you didn't want the image. So what we wanted to do is just pull down the little JSON file, take a look at that, and that would allow you to say, oh, yeah, that's what I want. I'll pull it down. So we opened up a pull request to Docker Inc. to, uh, to upstream Docker, and to do this, and they said no, they didn't want to confuse the CLI any more than it was already, you know, it was basically expanding too quickly. But they said, you know, these container images are just being stored at container registries. Container registries are nothing more than really a web service. So you could just basically go up to the web service and pull them down. It was standard web protocols. So they said build your own tool. So we did. We built Scopio. Scopio is the Greek word for remote viewing. So the idea was you could remotely view the JSON file. Well, the engineer that did this didn't stop there. He said, well, if I'm just going to pull down the JSON file, I can also build a protocol to pull down the image. Not only that, but I can build a protocol to push the image. And I can do it, and I can basically start to support additional protocols, so not just the Docker container protocol, but I can actually do things like install into directories. I can convert images into OCI images. I can take it and actually put it directly into the Docker daemon. I can actually pull and put it into different types of storage. So with Scopio now, I can move container images all around the environment. And guess what? You don't need to be root to do this. Okay, so now I can build a tool. We have a tool that really is sort of like RCP or SCP in that I can move, instead of moving files around the environment, it can actually move images back and forth. This tool has become very popular with people managing lots and lots of images. And think about it, if you have If you have a company that wants to basically pull down content from the Internet, and put it into your, your own private container registry, you could actually build a tool, I mean, build a script on Scopio just to constantly pull down the latest version of whatever image you like and then put it into your local registry on your machine. So Scopio came out um, basically a, few, a couple of years ago, and um, we actually, again, were working CoreOS. So Red Hat at this time was working with CoreOS, and when CoreOS was interested, they wanted to use Scopio for their rocket project. So they wanted to basically be able to copy images into Rocket from container registries, and they wanted to take advantage of Scopio. But they didn't want to use Scopio, you know, exec out to Scopio. They wanted to make it into a library. So what we did is we split Scopio into two different packages. So there's a library, and then the Scopio is a CLI on top of it, and we created a GitHub containers image. 
Now, GitHub Containers Image, the number one contributor outside of Red Hat, is actually Pivotal. And if you know anything, Pivotal competes directly against OpenShift, and I work for OpenShift. But that's the way open source works. So Pivotal is using Containers Image to move OCI images around the environment into their local um, into their local uh, storage, and then using Garden or whatever they they call it to run their containers. So I have the ability to I define what a container image is. I have a protocol for moving the container images from container register to local machine. Next thing I need to do is I need to store them on disk. Okay, I need to take those tar balls and untie them. And the way I untie them, I want to maintain when I'm untiring them that, that whole layered structure that I talked about earlier. And so the way we do that in Linux is this thing called copy and write file systems. And these are things like Overlay, ButterFS, Device Mapper, um, all sort of anybody that's ever played with Docker Daemon has configured things like, oh, I'm going to use the Overlay driver. Um, well, all those drivers were actually originally written, or most of those drivers were written by Red Hat. So when we were heavily contributing to the Docker project, we kept on adding new um, um, layered co copy and write file systems. What we decided to do is to move those out into a separate library so that the tools could use it and we could create a container storage. So now I have ability, I have to find what an image is, I'm able to pull the image, I'm able to store it on disk. The last thing I need to do now is actually execute the container. And to do that, we have another standard. So second thing the OCI standard, standards body did is they defined what it meant to run a container. So if you think about when I pull down a container, there's the container image. And the container image basically identifies what the developers define for that application. So the JSON file associated with that. The second person that puts in data into what it means to run a container is the container engine. Okay, and that would be things like Docker and other tools we're going to be talking about in a minute. But the container image sort of sets up these sort of standards. What security labels, you know, what SE Linux labels, what uh, security am I going to drop when I run the container? Things like that. The last person that puts in input into what it means to run a container is the user or the orchestrator that's going to start up the container. So anybody that's ever run the Docker CLI knows that they can do things like, you know, dash dash security ops or dash v to add a volume and things like that. So we take the input from the JSON file associated with the um, container image, we have whatever was hard coded into the container engine, and then we have the user input. And what we want, need to do is we need to combine all three of those things and create another JSON file. And that JSON file is the OCI runtime spec. So what the OCI runtime spec is defined when it, that JSON file that finally gets put onto disk and defines what the user, the container engine, and the container image wanted to do when running a container on the system. Then we have a tool that reads that JSON file, talks to Linux kernel, configures the kernel to run the container, sets up the C groups, the security constraints, and the namespaces. Everybody got it so far? So we had a standard created for that, for what's in that JSON file, and then we have the default tool. So Docker basically contributed a tool into the OCI effort called Run C. And Run C is the default implementation of the OCI runtime spec. Run C is run by almost every container engine in the world. This is the tool that actually launches and runs containers is Run C. So I'm going to be talking about things like Docker or container engines, and then I'm going to be talking about OCI runtimes or container runtimes. So we have the ability to define an image, pull an image, store it on disk, and then finally launch it, launch the container. Anything missing from this? No big fat container, David's. There's no reason to have a big fat container daemon to do this, right? So I have a real, I'm really disappointed that here we are, right, containers, Red Hat announced containers in RHEL 7 timeframe, which is five years ago. So five years into this container revolution, there's only one way to do everything. If I asked you people how to inspect a container, you'd say I'd do a darker pull and a darker inspect. Everything goes through the big fat container daemon. Because everything goes through that container daemon, we get the least common security. We have people having to have these big root applications running on their host. And what I want to do is I want to break that apart. Because we have these libraries, we want to look at new ways of running containers. We have the standards in, in place, so we, let's get rid of the big fat container daemons.
As I mentioned earlier, I work for OpenShift. OpenShift is the um, is basically I like to call it Kubernetes plus plus. So it's the enterprise version of Kubernetes from Red Hat, and then we add additional features on top of that. I work for OpenShift, so basically what OpenShift wants, I have to deliver at the lowest level of the operating system. So what does OpenShift and Kubernetes need to do run the container? So when I want to run a container out of Kubernetes, it becomes the user, and what does it need to do? Well, first of all, let's step back and look at CoreOS again. So CoreOS, the original version of Kubernetes had Docker thoroughly embedded into the, into the daemon. Docker, the entire Docker API, all it ever did was talk Docker API. CoreOS wanted to use Rocket. They wanted to use Kubernetes to launch Rocket containers. So what they did is they built a huge patch set and gave it up to the upstream Kubernetes community that said, if def Docker do it this way, else if Rocket do it this way. And the upstream uh, Kubernetes community said, no, we're not going to do that because, you know, two weeks later, Pivotal is going to come along and say, if God and do it this way. And so what they did is they turned it on its head and they said, instead of us supporting lots, lots and lots of container engines inside of our code base, we will call out the container engine. And we will define a protocol for what it means for Kubernetes to be able to launch a container. And they created a thing called CRI, Container Runtime Interface. And this is basically just the protocol that they will talk to a socket that listens and say, hey, I want to run the Nginx container. I want to set up these volumes in it. I want to set up these security labels, things like that. So that was introduced because CoreOS came to them and said that they triggered CRI. So Kubernetes, Kubernetes tells CRI to run a container image, run the Nginx. So CRI needs to pull the container from a container registry, needs to store it on top of a copy on write file system, needs to execute an OCI runtime. Look familiar? So my team saw this and they said, we can do that. We can build a skinny daemon just to do that and they introduced Cryo. How many people have heard of Cryo? Okay, a bunch more heard of Cryo. So Cryo uh, came out, was, Cryo was introduced, uh, well, 1.0 came out about a year ago today, um, right in the end of, middle of December. Oh, I guess we're not quite December yet. Uh, so we're going to talk about Cryo now. So we introduced Cryo. And so let's look at what Cryo needs. So Cryo needs those four functions that we talked about earlier, but it needs a few more things. Uh, but first of all, I want you to understand, and I'm going to beat this to death, Cryo is tied to Kubernetes. Its only purpose in the world is to service whatever Kubernetes wants. Okay? Use the standard building components, nothing more, nothing less. If Kubernetes decides they need a new feature, we put it into Cryo. That's it. So I like to say Cryo loves Kubernetes. Okay? And we represent her as a the the, the you know um, snowboarding uh, lady you saw earlier, but she's basically a one man woman. Okay? She's looked at Mesosphere, said not interested. She looked at Swarm, definitely not. She looked at Moby. No chance, and definitely not Docker. Okay, it only supports Kubernetes. All right, it, that's all it's for. So what are the components that we need to be able to build Cryo? Well, the first thing we need is we needed a way to generate that OCI runtime spec. Right, remember I talked about the three inputs? Well, now we have Kubernetes as one input, what we define as the defaults inside of Cryo, and then what the image is. We need a tool to be able to assemble that into an OCI runtime specification. It turns out there's a library that was also built by Red Hat called the OCI Runtime Tools. It's part of OCI, so we you take advantage of that. The next thing we needed is basically a way to configure the network. So anybody that's played with Kubernetes knows that Kubernetes uses CNI to set up networks. CNI was introduced by CoreOS. So CoreOS developed CNI so that people could have a plug-in interface to define different types of networking. So CNI is a plug-in interface, yet, yet another plug-in, um, but, but basically it's a standard way for, for vendors to be able to plug in their own network stacks. Um, so we've tested this with Flannel, Weave, OCI, SDN, but there's probably 20 companies that are also providing different types of hardware um, 
VPNs, things like that. So there's lots and lots of VPN action going on in CNI. Lastly, we needed a way to monitor the containers. I talked about an OCI runtime, and OCI runtime launches the container, configures the kernel, and then goes away. So run C never stays running on your system when you run a container. That's why you've never probably heard of it. Didn't even know it was running out there. So run C just configures the container and then goes away. Well, we have to have something monitoring the container, right, to basically watch for the container exit code and record it somewhere. We need a way to handle logging, to log to the files. We need a way to monitor what's going on, and then we need a way for people to connect back to it. So we built a little C program called Conmon. Container monitoring. And this allows us to monitor and watch what's going on inside of the container. So when you're running containers, we'll have one conmon per, per container. So Kubernetes, this is what the architecture looks like. Kubernetes basically uses a concept of pods. They don't run containers. So a pod is one or more containers inside of the same group of namespaces. So here we have a, a demonstration, and actually it's um, you'll see up here we have what's called the infra container. An infra container is a container that does nothing. It basically starts up and falls asleep instantaneously and just holds open the namespaces. And then Kubernetes adds individual containers to the pod. And what they, what they get with this is the ability to run multiple pods. Now, pods are always run together, but you can run multiple containers all inside of a pod. And you're going to see going forward, lots and lots of people are adding these secondary containers. So you have sort of your primary purpose of your container, but then you have what's called a sidecar container. And a sidecar container is usually something to do with security, so sort of monitoring what's going on in the primary container, um, as well as uh, Istio, you might have heard of, is a way to set up like specialized network groups. Um, and so a lot of people are investigating how they can uh, put a secondary container that really just monitors or influences the primary container running inside of the pod. Um, but as you see, there's going to be a conmon for each one of these containers to monitor what's going on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the status of Cryo. So Cryo is all, um, one of the interesting things, I haven't updated this slide, is because we're so tied to Cryo, we wanted to make sure that we never break Kubernetes, so, so tied to Kubernetes. So right now, if you want to open up a pull request to the Cryo to add new features or anything into Cryo, you have to pass every single test suite that Kubernetes has, that OpenShift has, and this here is lying because we're now up over a thousand. So you have to pass a thousand tests. If anything breaks, your pull request will not get into, into um, cryo. So again, our real goal here is to be totally no PRs merged without passing every single test. So we came out, as I said, a year ago with Kubernetes 1.0, um, and then we came out with, so we, the engineers wanted a 1.0, so we had a 1.0, but now we basically match whatever Kubernetes is. So for Kubernetes 1.9, you'll have Cryo 1.9, Kubernetes 1.10, Cryo 1.10. Anybody have an idea what Kubernetes 1.11 requires? Okay, 1.11, 1.12. Uh, OpenShift 4.0, as of OpenShift 4.0, we are moving to Cryo by default. OpenShift is no longer going to use Docker Daemon underneath the covers. So it's going to move totally to Cryo. OpenShift Online right now, which is supporting thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of users, is using Cryo. We're also, also Cryo is being used, Cryo is being used in Microsoft Azure for running a thing called Kata Containers, which I'm not, I guess I don't have in this presentation, but I'll talk a little bit about it. So Kata Containers is a different way. I talked about the traditional way of running containers. There's another way of running containers called Kata, K-A-T-A, -A, um, and that was originally Clear Linux. You might have heard of Clear Linux. So Intel developed a thing called Clear Linux Containers, another company, Hypershell, created another way of running containers, but basically they use KVM to separate the containers. So they actually built more secure containers um, using uh, KVM technologies um, with the cost of some performance and other issues, but basically um, Kata containers are also available. So cry right now, um, if you're running Kata containers inside of Microsoft, you're most likely using Cryo. So Cryo is per, uh, doing OpenShift Online, but our real goal, as I said, is to make Containers, running containers in production. Boring. Okay, and perhaps you're thinking that of me right now. Okay, so 
So what, because we are basically looking at containers in production, we can basically start to tighten security. So right now in Docker, when you use Docker, you have a hard-coded limit. Now, I mentioned capabilities in the beginning, but capabilities is a way of breaking apart the power of root on a system. Okay, and we drop a whole bunch of capabilities inside of Docker before you run a root-based container. But we can actually drop a bunch more. There's a bunch in it because you expect to be able to build containers as well as run containers. But if all we're doing is running containers in production, we can actually drop another four or five capabilities. So where Docker might have 12, we have about six capabilities that are required to run. Not only that, but you can go in and configure it. Docker has it hard coded in the code. We actually have a config file. If you decide that these capabilities are too chancy to run inside of your container by default, you can actually turn them off. So um, does, Cryo doesn't do builds, doesn't has less capabilities. We also have the ability to run containers in production in read-only mode. You really don't want your containers running in production to be running in read-write mode. Read-write means the process inside of the container can write to slash user. I would prefer, I think all containers in production should have slash user as read-only. You don't want a container that gets hacked to be able to rewrite itself. But by default, almost all containers you run in the world have that ability because, again, they're developed to be able to build containers. So we combine the ability to build containers with also running them in production. So with Cryo, it's just about running them in production under Kubernetes, run them in read-only mode. I mentioned Kata container support earlier. We're also building better user namespace support. We can make assumptions about user namespace, which again, probably half the people doesn't know what it is, but user namespace is a security feature that's been around since the beginning, but no one's ever used it. So we're experimenting now with trying to get Kubernetes to use user namespace, and in Cryo, we can actually take really good advantage of user namespace. It basically allows us to run containers, root processes inside of containers as non-root outside of containers. So we're really looking forward to being able to experiment with that. So that's Cryo. So what else does OpenShift need to run a container? Well, OpenShift doesn't just run Kubernetes. As I mentioned, it's Kubernetes++. In the OpenShift world, you want to be able to build applications. So OpenShift started out as a way for people to build applications to run in the cloud. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to allow them to build applications to run in containers. And OpenShift has some really nice features around doing that thing called source to image and stuff, but we needed a way to basically allow um, OpenShift to be able to build containers. So this is a fellow worker, a guy who works for, for me named Nalan Daibai. Um, a year ago, uh, two years ago actually now, um, we were sitting at a really great conference that happens every year in, in Czech Republic called DevConf. And um, DevConf brings about 2,000 engineers. There's no marketing, no nothing. It's just engineers talking to each other. Um, and he's the guy that's in charge of container storage. And I was sitting with him, and I said to him, I really need a way for us to build core utilities for containers. And what I meant by that is I wanted to basically create a directory on disk, put some content in it, tire it up, create a JSON file, and push it to a container manager, because right? that's all OCI image is. So I needed the ability to do that. And he said, I could probably hack together something to do that really quick. And he said, what do you want me to call it? And I said, I don't care what you call it. And I said, call utilities for containers. And he said, no, come on, give me a name. I said, I, I don't know, just, well, just call it Builder. And of course, he made fun of my Boston accent. <laughs> um, so uh, Builder came out uh, basically at the end of the uh, the conference, like two days later, he got up in a, a lightning session and actually demonstrated Builder for the first time. Um, and so we have a great artist that works for us that does the coloring books. Um, and she drew, this is a Boston Terrier. So that's, you know, pl plugs in a theme. And the first time we tweeted out this picture of, of uh, the Builder image, the first response that came back is, why do you have a dog with tidy whities on its head? <laughs> So I actually still use the icon, even though the icon has changed and Scott, you know, she got a little upset, Maureen Duffy, and uh, she made it a lot more yellow and has more ridges and uh, stuff, but I still use it just for the laugh on that. So uh, we created a tool called uh, Builder, and of course my theme became No Big Fat Demons. And uh, so this is the, uh, in the coloring book, uh, Containers Commandos coloring book, this is the representation of that dog as a superhero. 
Um, and of course, I think it looks just like Nolan. So if he makes fun of me, I'll, I'll say he looks like the dog. But so core utilities for building containers. So what we wanted is a very simple interface. So if I want to rebuild a container, I just need to do build a from. So build a from Fedora. Guess what happens? This goes out. The tool goes out to a container registry, finds out, finds the OCI image name Fedora, pulls it to my machine puts it onto container storage and creates a container. Now container is a heavily overused word, but in this case we're talking about a builder container or basically a modif this is this is basically the modification of what's in the tabball, right? Of, of what's in Fedora. So it creates a container on my system. And the next thing I do is I want to mount the container up. So I can do build and mount the container. And that gives me a mount point back. Okay, another quick segue. Segway. Anybody here ever play with Docker Copy? No one's ever played with Docker Couple people. It's really cool. What it's able to do is you're able to copy content from a container image to the host. And you're able to copy content from your host into the container image. It's an amazing, amazing tool. So I saw that and I said, I'm going to build a tool just like that. I called Mayan Copy. Okay, and I put it in the core utilities package. And with that tool, you're actually able to copy content from the host and put it into a container image or copy cont content out of the container image onto the host. I didn't stop there. I created another tool called DNF. Sometimes I call it yum, sometimes I call it DNF. And with this tool, I added a feature called install root. And with install root, I'm able to redirect to the mount directory and install content into it. I didn't stop there. I created a new utility called make. And with make, I'm able to do things like, and I came up with this concept of Dester. And uh, with Dester, I'm actually able to con take and redirect my output into the directory and put content into the container directory. So really what I'm pushing at here is you can use any container tool, any tool in your Linux tool bag to basically put content into a container image. And the really nice thing about this, unlike standard Docker files, you don't have to have all of your build tools inside of the container image. You don't have to have yum and python inside of your container image. You build them outside and just put content in it. So the next step you want to do is you want to basically configure. You want to conf basically configure the container or set those G fields in JSON like the environmental variables, this, the working directory, all that stuff that's in the JSON file. So there's a build a config command. Lastly, I can actually commit the container. So I can take the container I can create a container image from it. Okay, and that's the build a commit command. And then I can need to push the container. So I can actually take the container and push it to the Docker registry. Oops, I meant the container registry. So I can push it to any container registry in the world. Then that container image can be run by any container engine. You can run it with Docker, you can run it with Cryo, you can run it with, you know, you can actually use it with, with Builder. Okay, and the big thing to understand here is there is no container daemon. Not only that, but you can do this stuff without being root. Okay? Dan, wait, wait. wait. What, what about, about Docker files? I'm glad you asked. So Builder obviously has to support Docker file. Everybody, you know, everybody in the container world thinks that the only way to build containers is with a Docker file. So we support Docker files. And we have a tool called Builder, build using Docker file. But of course, we're engineers, and that's too many letters to correct. To type, so we have build a bud. Um, so build a bud, no Anheuser Busch relationship here, although if they want to sponsor it, I'd be all for it. Um, but build a bud is basically how you can build, con uh, build container images um, using Docker files. Does build have a script No, I didn't make one called build a file, but I came up with a great, awesome different differentiator. I built this really awesome scripting language that allows you to basically script how you're going to build container images and I called it bash. <laughs> okay, so my goal here is to basically use standard tools to build container images, right? To build a root of fest and then tie it up. Right? That's really all we needed to do with, with these container images. Um, but I really wanted other tools to start to use Builder to be able to build containers and use higher level languages on top of that. So we want, we're want we working with OpenShift right now to replace the Docker daemon with Builder so we can build containers. Almost everybody that builds container images right now has to talk to the Docker socket. 
right? Five years into the container revolution, the only way anybody has to build containers is by talking to a root process. And if I can talk to the darker socket, that is worse. If you want to give your engineers the ability to talk to the darker socket, just give them sudo without pat root password and allow them to delete your log files. Because giving someone access to the darker socket allows you to be full root on the system and to remove the fact that you ever did anything on the container, you know, on the system at all. So darker so access to the darker socket is one of the least secure things you could possibly do. So everybody that wants to build containers, say inside of Kubernetes, has to leak the darker socket in. Guess what OpenShift's doing? When you build containers, those containers running under Kubernetes are talking to the darker socket on those nodes. So we want to get rid of that and just use Builder under the covers. We're working with Ansible containers also to use Builder to build Ansible containers. So think about instead of using Docker files to define what a container is, use an Ansible playbook. So Ansible playbook now becomes another way of building containers or defining what goes into a container image. So security-wise, why is Builder better than using Docker build? Well, first of all, there is no big container daemon, as I already explained. You don't need to set up a daemon to be able to build these images. This is just using standard fork and exec. You can run your container builds in a lockdown container Kubernetes environment. So people right now are using Builder inside of lockdown containers to actually build container images. Okay, and you can do all that stuff without having. This is, I gotta fix this because it says we're working on running as non-root. No, it works as non-root right now. You can give, if your developers want to be able to build containers on certain machines that you don't want to give them root, you can use give them builder. And use taking advantage of the thing I mentioned, use a namespace earlier, they can actually build container images um, from their desktop um, without being root. We also can build minimal images using Builder, as I showed earlier, since the, the tools to build in the content inside of the container, like DNF, don't have to be inside of the container. We can put only the stuff inside the container that has to be there. So you can actually get, I don't care about size of containers, I can tear, care about the size of the attack surface of the container. If I hack into your system and I need, require Python to be able to do my attack, and you don't give me Python, then you've got more security. So what else does um, OpenShift need? Well, we need the ability to diagnose and basically give a you know, user the ability to feel what it means to run a container. So if you don't have Docker running in the containers, how do you figure out what's going on in your system? So we introduced a new, another tool called Podman. And it's what we call it as part of the LibPod. So Podman is being built out of LibPod. Uh, so LibPod is a library for building pods. You know, that was our goal. And Podman is the CLI, or the interface, to be able to use it. So you guys are getting a two-for-one deal here. I have a totally different talk I give called Replacing Docker with Podman. Okay, and I'm going to... Right, excellent. I should have stopped. Okay, so I'm about to give that talk to you. Okay, so this is how you do it. So you do a DNF install, Podman, or you can do a yum install if you're running on a rel system. And then you do alias docker equals Podman. Okay? And then you do, oh, any questions? <laughs> Shortest presentation ever. Okay. So, but you guys want more. You paid more money for that. But the reason I can say that is here we have someone that wrote a, a my favorite tweet ever um, back in May. So back in May 29th, he wrote, I completely forgot that almost two months ago I set up an alias of Docker equals Podman, and it has been a dream. And he uses my slogan, and he mentioned Project Atomic, which I have a shirt on. I'll talk about Project Atomic towards the end of the talk. Um, so he's been using Podman, and this guy down here, Joe Thompson, you know, I don't know who, who these people are, but they said, so what reminded you that you were running Podman instead of Docker? And he said he executed Docker help. And of course, when you execute Docker help, up pops Podman help, right? So um, he, he did that. So let's look a little bit at what Podman does. So introducing Podman. Podman is a tool for managing pods and containers under the Docker CLI. So we basically, if you want to list the containers that run in the system, Podman PS. If I want to run a container, Podman run. If I want to exec into the container, Podman exec. Podman images, okay? So basically what we did is we copied the entire Docker CLI 
and put a Podman command in front of it. And actually, I have one of my interns, former interns here, who did some of this work. So I took a bunch of interns over the last few years and basically said, let's, the last couple of years, and said, let's generate um, basically the Docker CLI. But it's no fun just talking about it. Let's actually demo, demonstrate it. Everybody see this in the back of the room? So I did this uh, about a week ago, and it blew up in my face, because this is a totally uh, totally live demonstration. It's bigger? How's that? Big enough? OK. So if I want to do Podman version, you see here, so this is, uh, I'm running this on top of Fedora 29 for those that are interested. Podman is available on RHEL 7.6, it's available on RHEL 8, it's available on all versions of Fedora, uh, it's available all versions of SUSE now, it's available in Ubuntu. Um, I know people have run it in Debian, I know people have built, run it, built running it on Gentoo, uh, but I'm demonstrating on top of Fedora. Um, so we're up to, we haven't released 1.0 yet, so we're up to uh, uh, 0 0.11. And here you can see Podman Info. This shows you what we're running on top of. So this is running on top of an overlay driver. The content is put into container storage. Um, you, so you get some information about what's running. I'm not going to try to scroll up. Um, so anyways, here we're going to look at a Docker file. And so this Docker file, um, basically, um, I'm going to run podman command, and I'm going to run a builder inside of the container. So I'm going to run builder container, which has built a build in, builder built into it, and it's going to do a podman run. And so I'm going to actually show you a build inside of a container using builder. So it's going to pull down Alpine. And this is where I do a little tap dance and hope that the network doesn't blow up in my face. So it's actually pulled down that. Now I'm going to actually show you the images, show that there's images inside of the container. Um, so you can see here, I pulled down, um, I pulled down Alpine from Docker IO into the container and I actually built a, built a new image uh, called my image. So if you were looking at the Podman command. I scrolled off the screen, but I said to build it, called, build my image. So this is all happening inside of a container. So this is Podman running a container, running builder inside of a container. So now I'm going to um, actually remove the container images from inside of the container. Now I'm going to remove all container images from the host. So everything I've shown up to now is actually running Podman as root on the system. So now I'm going to actually run Podman is non-root. So this is basically the entire Docker CLI without being root. Okay, so hopefully it works. So I'm going to pull Alpine. You see now I'm not running sudo before um, Podman. So um, that, now I'm going to run a container and that blows up in my face. Not sure why, but we'll ignore that. So there we can see Alpine inside of the, this is Alpine inside of my home directory. I'm going to see the images. So there's the Alpine um, image. And now I'm going to look at privileged images. So right now in my home directory, I don't have Alpine. But if I look at the host sudo, I have all the other images. So basically, I have isolation between what I'm doing as root with Podman versus what I'm running Podman in my home directory. But wait, there's more. So Builder has a command called unshare. So one of the things I'm doing when I'm building these containers um, as non-root is I'm taking advantage of the user namespace. Now, pros most of you probably never even played with the user namespace. But here I am. I'm inside of a container in my home directory. And if I look at my home directory now, home dwalsh, and I look at all the files, they're owned by root. Do you think all the files in my home directory are actually owned by root? So what's happening when I'm in a user namespace is it actually maps my user, 32, my UUID, which is 3267, as root inside of the container. And any of the files that are owned by 3267, the kernel reports them as being root. 
So this is how we're running Podman and Builder is non-root inside of a container. Any file that's not owned by me and is not mapped into the container, like Walsh Kids MPEG, I don't know why that's, you know, this is a, probably an old video that I can't show you of my kids, um, is for some reason is marked as negative one. And this is the way LS marks negative one. So these are any file, any UID that goes into a user namespace that isn't, the UID isn't mapped into it, will be reported as negative one and then I, and I'm not allowed to access it. So you see here, there's no access available to the file. So let's get out of user namespace. And to show you, if I do a cat proc self UID map, you'll see that this is a user, user namespace mapping. So this says that I map user 3267, which is my UID, to zero inside of the container, and I have a mapping of one. In, in a modern Linux system, um, they basically set up mappings when I log on, when I create a user account. And this says that starting at UID 100,000, for the next 65,000 UIDs, it'll be mapped. So UID one inside of my container is actually UID 100,001 on the system. And I'm going to show you in a second what those look like. But basically, that's how I'm able to map. And every, if just using standard Linux now, every user that you use or add gets one of these UID mappings. The next user on the system would be mapped from 100,655,037 to 65,000. So basically, every container gets mapped. So let's look a little further into user namespace. So Podman actually has full user namespace capability built into it, unlike Docker Daemon. So I can run lots and lots of containers, each one in a different user namespace. So I'm about to run a container. I'm mapping in this one. I'm using a UID mapping of zero to 100,000. And then I'm mapping the first 5,000 uh, UIDs inside of it. So you know, UID 1 is, is 100,001, 100,002, 100,003, all the way up to 100,499. Okay, so I'm running one container with that UID, and now I'm going to look. So one other thing we've added to Podman um, that, unlike Docker, is we actually have ability to look at the user namespace and, uh, to basically do more revealing of what's going on inside the containers. So here I'm saying I want to look at the latest user and host user. So the user process, if I ask the container what what it's running as, it'll say I'm running as root. If I look at the on the host system, I looked at the container, I'd see that's actually running as 100,000. So now if I look at, the, if I actually prove it to you, I'll look for sleep in my container, and you'll see that the sleep that I'm running here is running as UID 100,000, even though if I was inside the container, it would say it's running as root. So now I'm going to run another container. This container is now running, starting at 200,000 for 5,000 containers, instantaneously creates a container. If I look at the, that container now, you'll see that it's running as root in 200,000. And if I do the PS command, now you'll see I have two root processes running outside of my container. One is 100,000 and one is 200,000. If these containers break out of their containment to attack each other, I'd have UID 200,000 attacking UID 100,000. And obviously, we relied on Linux security for discretionary access control. We know that timeshare systems, everything else is protected. Obviously, there's lots and lots of other protections like SC Linux involved, but this is taking advantage of user namespace. So another interesting thing about Podman versus Docker is Podman uses the fork exec model. Docker is a client server model. When you fork exec, um, there is a, well, let's take a, let me show you something. So anybody here familiar with login UID? I know some of is. All right, login UID is a field that gets set when you log on to the system. After it is set, it can never be unset. So I log into the system. My login UID is 3267. So if I cat out for any process I'm running, if I cat out login UID, you will see that I'm running as 3267. If I become root, my login UID is 3267. If I go through sudo, if I go any way to do anything on the system, 
it records that I'm logging UID 3267. So if I cause havoc on the system, the logging system knows that Dan Walsh did it. It doesn't know that root did it. It doesn't see root did it. So in a fork exec model, that means every process that I exec is going to be owned by 3267. So in a container, when I run a Podman container, my login UID is still 3267. Now I'm going to run Docker. No, oh, that's why it's not running. Oh. Obviously, I didn't precede this enough, so it's actually running, pulling down Fedora container. I'll do a tap dance while this waits. But basically, it's going to pull down the container and run a Docker container on it. And we'll. I ran this earlier, so it must have. Yeah, go ahead. They were using the Podman runtime. And so Podman is a uh, container engine, but basically it's using Run C underneath the covers. So Podman is exacting Run C just like Docker Daemon executes Run C. Run C supports the Docker Daemon supports user namespace for one user namespace. So it has the ability to run a single user namespace. So you can run the Docker Daemon all of your containers with a single user namespace. What it doesn't support is easily using multiple user namespaces, which, which I just showed. And of course, this is hopefully this will be done. Any other quick questions? All this to show. Hey, there it is. So that was a long way to show that the UID proc self login UID of a container running in Docker is, remember this number from before? Minus one. Why is that, anybody know? Why is my container running under Docker not showing that it's dwalsh? I'll tell you. <laughs> Docker is a client server operation. When you run the Docker commands, you, the process, the container, it tries to make you feel like that container is your child process. It isn't. It is a communication with the Docker daemon, and it's taking the output and making you feel like it. So it's hooking up standard output and standard in to a protocol that talks to the Docker daemon to do it. So because of the fork in exec, when I boot up a system, every process that's started by system D is owned by minus one. It never logged into the system, right? It's only when I go through SSH daemon or through a login program that it records the fact that I am UID 3267. So let's take a look at what the ramifications of that. So anybody that's played with the auditing subsystem, we can create, um, you can basically say watch Etsy shadow. So this basically says watch anybody that's changing Etsy shadow. Um, so I just wrote a, ran a Docker a pod, Podman program, runs privileged, it's mounting slash into the container, slash host, Fedora, and then it's modifying Etsy shadow. Right, so it mounted that. So this is basically showing what would happen if I broke out of a container running Podman to modify Etsy Shadow. And I look here and I actually look at the audit log. And in the audit log, it says that somebody evil modified Etsy Shadow. And look what it says it says that Dan Walsh did it. Now, if I do the exact same command under Docker and I look at what the audit log says, and it says audit D is unset. So from a security point of view, using standard fork exec model for your containers means that the auditing subsystem can record that you started a container that actually went haywire and, and caused trouble in your system. So other Podman features. So I'm gonna kick off another container. It can show you Podman top has the ability to reveal different fields inside of the container, including what the default SE Linux label is for the container that's running. So here we have that. I've shown you the user namespace stuff. We can actually show you whether or not you're running in setcomp mode. So whether or not the container processes have setcomp associated with it. Remember I talked about capabilities, the Linux capabilities that the cryo is able to set a much smaller group than what uh, Docker did by default. Well, these are the Docker defaults. So, um, Ability to write to the audit system. I don't know why that's turned on by default. Uh, 
Um, and his ability to chone, this is his ability for a process to chone a different process that it doesn't own. DAC override means that I can ignore discretionary access control. Um, this one right here, make nodes. So I'm able to create device nodes. Why in a container and production environment would you want to allow a process to create device nodes? So you can break out. Right, well, <laughs> that's a good reason. But basically it's needed because we're building container images. So you might need to, when you're building a container image, you might need to be able to build a container image. NetBind service means that I can bind to ports less than 1024. It's kind of hard in a root container to get away without doing that. Similarly, we have set UID, which basically most containers start as root and then become non-root. You need set UID to change from root to non-root. I know I always thought that was kind of crazy, but that's the way the kernel works. And such IDs is capable, is similar. Set FCAP and set PCAP is basically again, because I'm doing installations. So when I'm in running in cryo mode, I don't need that. I don't need make node. I don't need shown. I don't need a whole bunch of stuff when I'm running inside of a contain containers in production. So I can actually eliminate a bunch of these. But this is sort of the standard, so we're following the, you know, what people expect to run their containers. OK. So um, basically, I jump down. So Podman is a pod manager. It's not just a Docker replacement. We also want to be able to manage pods and look at new ways of doing stuff with pods. So I just listed out that there's no pods in the system. But now I'm going to create a pod. So I'm going to create a pod in the system. And remember, pods are one or more containers. So I'm going to create a container and put it inside of that pod I just created. I'm going to create another container and put it inside of the pod. So at this point, I don't have anything running on the system, but I've created a pod called pod test, and I've added two containers to it. So now if I look at the, what's running on my system, hopefully there's nothing. So there's no containers running. And so now I'm going to start my pod. After I've started the pod, you'll notice the two containers are running. So now I can manage multiple containers from a single pod command. And this is very similar to what Kubernetes does. So basically, I kicked off those two. And now if I want to stop my pod, it'll stop those containers. And um, when I create this command, waits 10 seconds, because uh, obviously running sleep does not handle signals correctly. So it's, it's waiting to basically, it's stopping all the containers before stopping the pod. We've actually had, we're having lots and lots of discussions of what powerful things we can start to do with multiple pods inside the container. So now if I look at the processes that are running in containers, I'll see that there's no containers running on my system. Now I'm going to remove the pod from my system. And now we're back to no pods running. So basically, with pods, I can start to experiment and, and sort of play around. Similar to how we played around with Docker for running containers over these years, I want to start to play with pods, but using a very simple, simple interface that most people have become familiar with. So security of... of so security of Podman, uh, we've discussed most of these and actually demonstrated. But obviously, whoop, the big thing here is there's no daemon. So this is not no client server operation on. There's no daemon. I've showed you you can run Podman as non-root on your system. Uh, no need to leak the Docker socket. So if you want to run Podman inside of Podman inside of Podman, you can do that type of stuff. Um, you can run managed containers without being root. No need for access to the Docker socket. Containers run as child. I've showed that with better auditing. Um, we also support things like socket, act socket activation. These are things you can't do in a client server operation. So if you've ever played with socket activation inside of systemd, it runs a, basically it has a unit file that systemd listens out of socket. And when a connection comes in for that socket, it starts the service and hands the socket connection over to the service. That means you have to, can have less and less services running by default on your system. And then they only get activated when a process, uh, connection comes in. So you can actually do that with a Podman container running inside of systemd. Um, embedded auditing, as I demonstrated. Um, um, you also can run things like systemd. For some reason, Docker Inc. hated the idea of ever running systemd inside of a container. 
And yet our customers are always coming to us and have these unit files and these big complex applications that they run inside of virtual machines and they want to run them inside of containers. And Docker says go off and build a shell script to be able to do this. And we say, no, just run systemd inside the container. You can run your, your basically existing services the way they do. So Podman has fully integrated systemd inside of it. So if you decide to run a container with systemd, we will configure it correctly so systemd will work. We support SD Notify. So Systemd came up with this concept of SD Notify. Think about starting a, uh, so Systemd starts uh, services, and usually when you start a service, there's other services that are relying on that service being started. Well, as soon as you start a service, doesn't mean that the service is actually running. The service might take 10, 20 seconds to actually get itself up and ready to service requests. So what systemd did is created a protocol called SD Notify that basically allows, say, a database go off and initialize itself and then send a message to systemd saying, I'm ready for services, to service requests at this point. Docker daemon running containers never supports this, again, because it doesn't do fork exec model. Um, so we built into Podman full support for SD Notify. Socket activation, I did. So we didn't stop just there with Podman. So another interesting thing about Podman is it is just a tool written in Go to run containers, but people wanted to be able to use other code to basically interact, other programs to do interact with it, things like Python. So people wanted to use Python to manipulate containers. So there's a new protocol available in the latest Linuxes called Virelink. So Virelink is basically, I, I like to think of it as a potential replacement for Dbus, but we have added Virelink support to Podman. And you can basically run Podman as a service on your system and allow Virelink connections to come into it. So uh, this is what it looks like. So this, out of the box, if you enable the Podman I.O. service, you can have tools interacting with it, including Python. So this is a Python binding. So we built a library called LivePython, or LivePodman, that allows you to execute import Podman and then execute system info. So this is basically the equivalent to that Podman info command I did before, but it's totally written in Python. What's happening here is this is using a Violink protocol to talk to Podman, which is actually doing the heavy lifting for running the container. So there's full, full Python bindings on a remote protocol to Podman. Of course, because it's doing that, we lose the ability for the minus one thing. So shh, don't tell anybody. Okay, so PyPodMan, so we've also built a program called PyPodMan that actually is a full implementation in Python of the PodMan command, but it uses a remote protocol. So it, it does PyMan pod, list, PodMan everything, you know, PS, all those commands, but it's written in Python and it's talking over Violink to PodMan. So why do we do that? Well, if you watch this video here, um, it actually shows PodMan running on a Mac talking over SSH protocol to Podman Violink running inside of a container image. So what we're doing here is we're allowing people to run on top of Macs and Windows to be able to interact with containers on top of a Linux box. So that was our goal with this. So we didn't want to only support Python, we also wanted to be able to support Node.js so uh, in order to run Cockpit. So if anybody doesn't know what Cockpit is, it's a GUI interface, a web interface into managing your Linux boxes. So we have a full cock Cockpit Podman is basically ability to run and manage Podman containers inside of a web interface. So what don't we do with Podman? Well, we don't do auto start and auto restart. That's system D's job. This is one of those things Docker Demon wanted to like reinvent the operating system. So they wanted to handle things like starting and stopping, of, uh, restarting of services. Um, so what we do is say, if you want to have a, a daemon, I mean, a, a container that's constantly running on the system, put it in a unit file, just like you would put any other service. Treat it just like a regular service. Obviously, we're never going to support Docker Swarm because we're, we, we believe in Kubernetes as the way to orchestrate your systems. Uh, right now, we don't support Notary. Although, if any uh, upstream people want to uh, put notary support in, we'd be fully willing to ac accept it. We actually support uh, what we call simple signing, which is something uh, Red Hat built. Um, and um, we, it says we don't support health checks, although that's coming. So that actually just got merged into Builder. 
Uh, by the way, there is a po there is a podman build command that works just like the Docker build command, except that it's running pod well, it's, it's importing podman builder into it, so it's actually using builder underneath the covers, um, not the command. It's it vendors the library. Um, we don't support the Docker API, so anybody that's built tools that talk directly to the Docker API, we can't support with podman right now, but. We do uh, obviously support Vilink, so if you want to have a remote protocol where you talk to containers, we have that. Uh, we support very limited Docker volumes. Docker volumes that most people probably have never played with, but Docker volumes is a way for people to build volume plugins, so storage plugins. Um, but we're actually working on adding that adding that support into to it. So that's the end of the talk. Um, so we covered Cryo, Builder, Scopio, Podman. Container storage, containers image. There's three upstreams to give you an idea of who's who's using these. So Cryo is being used uh, heavily by, as I said, Red, Red Hat, Intel. Uh, we've uh, it's been used somewhat inside of Microsoft. Um, um, actually, Suzy's way ahead of Red Hat in, in its adoption of of these tools. Um, so they're using they're, they're, all their services now run on top of Cryo. Um, we have at the low level tools as I mentioned, companies like Pivotal and and Fujitsu and lots and lots of companies contributing up and down in the stack. And this and it's fully open. There's nothing. We're not building Red Hat's business model into the container. We wanted to allow this to be a fully uh, operate, fully open project. Uh, most of these tools are under GitHub slash containers. Um, Cryo is underneath Kubernetes again because we love Kubernetes so much. We're tied into the Kubernetes SIGs. Um, there's full uh, all the blogs and information are all tracked under this. At this point, any questions? Everybody's convinced this is the way to go. Yes. How far? Oh, oh, you're gonna walk up and. Uh, how are containers run as the not? Uh, non-root user if uh, you need root to uh, enter C groups and change namespaces. Okay, so um, because we're using user namespace, we're able to put containers into user namespaced C groups. Well, C groups is a little shaky, but um, systemd allows you to set C groups based on your C group. So if you're running in a container underneath this user C groups, we can actually further subdivide, uh, but we're putting you inside a user namespace capabilities, uh, user namespace namespaces. Okay, so we're not putting you into the standard system. So a root process running inside of a user namespace is able to set up hit namespace and is able to set up um, all those namespaces. So that's all allowed by the Linux kernel. Uh, under your user namespace, yes. And one thing you have to have is you have to have any UIDs you create inside of your container have to be mapped into your user namespace. So, yes. Um, whoa, hot mic. Uh, what are the namespaces shared by the pods or a single pod? So by default, a single pod uh, shares the network namespace and the IPC namespace. A lot of containers also share the PID namespace, but that's not... So pod, so again, these are things that Kubernetes does by default, mm -hmm. and so our our containers basically match the Kubernetes so a pod. But you're able to you're able to inside of the podman command pick additional namespaces that you want shared between the pod in the pod, or more or less. So you can. So that was a Kubernetes. So Kubernetes basically system. defined what a pod was, and the, their definition of a pod says that it's a it's a group of containers who share the same network namespace and the same IPC namespace. And what Hid namespace came later, so right now there's some some argument about whether or not eventually PID namespace will be shared by default by pods under Kubernetes. What value is there in having containers in the same pod? Or sharing a network namespace? Well, sharing the same network so they can see each other, so they can see, see the same things that the network shares. You really want them sort of in it. So like the Istio sidecar container, mm -hmm. it's able to know you're connected to this device, and then it's able to modify the device to reroute traffic. Um, so it's really about seeing, that's why the PID namespace is kind of difficult that it wasn't there by default. Yeah. Um, but I think going forward, the PID namespace, so that the pro they can see each other's processes and stuff like that. Usually, 
when they one container is more powerful than the, you know, the so the sidecar is usually more powerful than the primary. Okay, thank you. You're in a shop that's currently running Kubernetes. Could we replace the build process with just build it today? Is it completely compatible? Or does, yeah, do so we have to change everything else? No, you could. So all these tools are totally independent. You can run a full Docker. You can run Builder inside of Docker containers. You can, uh, there's nothing special about any of these tools. The only, th the special part is they're all st sharing the same storage. So Podman can see Builder storage, Builder and Podman can see uh, Cryo storage. So they're able to de deal with the storage level um, sharing. But yeah, you can run inside of a Docker-based Kubernetes environment right now. You could run Builder today. You could build Builder, and people have done that. Yeah. Anybody else? We got someone coming up. Uh, so uh, you're obviously a, a fan of SE Linux. That's your exactly. big thing. Um, but SE Linux doesn't work in containers. And there's all these newer like Linux security things, like SecComp is continuing to be developed. Landlock LSM is coming too soon. Uh, and these do work in containers. Do you feel like SE Linux has a future? No. Oh, so I would say, first of all, I care about I care about outside of the container more than I care about inside the container. So most of these tools, most of the tools that you're talking about, like SecComp, SE Linux um, capabilities, are all about controlling the process inside of the container, not breaking out of the container. If I'm working in a true microservices environment, I really want a single service inside of the container. Okay, so SE Linux not running inside the container. I would ask you what protects your file system what, um, when you run a container. If a container breaks out, what's the only thing that protects the file system? I'll give you the answer. It's SE Linux. So none of those tools. SecComp doesn't protect it. User namespace doesn't protect it. Capabilities doesn't protect it. Basically, if I can get out to the file system as a root user, I'm able to basically read and write pretty much anything on the system, especially where I, if I have set UID. So the only thing that protects, Docker has been broken out of twice, um, been broken out of twice, or there's been two CVEs about breakouts of Docker, and both of those were thwarted by SC Linux because there were file system, uh, file system escapes. So none of these tools that you talked about right now are talking about file system. AppArmor actually works inside of the container, but doesn't work outside the container. So if you think about inside the container, in a microservices world, I'm just going to be running Apache. And I basically expect that Apache is able to write to its directories. And if I'm running read-only containers, it's only able to write to the directories that I've actually given it to write to. So there's no reason to further sub-control what's going on inside the container. Now, if you want to call me on that, from a security point of view, if I'm running those systemd-based containers where I'm running multiple services inside of the container, yeah. then it does fail, okay? But there's nothing, th those fail for basically, everything fails at that level because, except, well, maybe AppArmor doesn't. Um, but so SecComp doesn't protect you there because SecComp doesn't know anything about the files. It can basically say, I can't read, but that's going to cause breakage, right? So, so look at these as all, you know, this is not, I have SecComp, so I don't need SC Linux, or I have SC Linux, so I don't need SecComp, or I don't need capabilities. It's basically defense in depth. Anytime I look at security, it's all about, I want more. I want more locks. I want more blocks. I want more ways of protecting, controlling those processes. Right now, Carter Containers is not using SC Linux inside of those containers. Got the KVM separated, but guess what they're looking at? They're turning on SC Linux because they know that they want to make sure that if I am inside of a container, inside of a separate KVM, I want to protect my kernel from the process inside of those containers, so I use SC Linux so I can prevent escape. So th those are all, but yeah. SC Linux is, SC Linux and containers is sort of, in my opinion, is a perfect marriage because it eliminates everybody that's ever played with SC Linux, so it's hard. Inside of containers, SC Linux is easy because all we're doing is we're wrapping the container um, under control. And to give you a further, to beat this to death, I don't have it on me right now, but anybody here have an Android cell phone? Okay. Do you guys send force zero inside that cell phone? Do you know that 90% of all Android cell phones come with SC Linux turned on by default? Did you know that? And there's no way to turn it off? Guess why? They're running containers. Your cell phone is the biggest container platform in the world. 
Right, a container is just, you know, they call them applications. But guess what? They're applications that can find the application saying, this is controlled by C groups, it's controlled by SC Linux, it's controlled by SecComp, things like that, right? So the, S, the, the, the Android operating system, I think it's something like 90% of all uh, Android, any, any modern Android phone now has SC Linux on by default. Again, to control, make sure there's no breakout, okay? Anybody else? All right, it's 8.10. I'm done. Oh, you have something? Oh, Seymour's going to try to give me something. What's the next there. thing you're going to build? What's the next thing I'm going to build? I don't know. I'm close to retirement, yeah. i got to see how this IBM deal goes. Uh, <laughs> No, the uh, uh, so we're continuing we're continuing to heavily work on a lot of this stuff. With lots of new features. Um, again, you know, we're really concentrating on making bringing up the quality of this stuff to uh, what people expect, and we're really always looking for new ideas. So the great thing about this is we're all, you know we're always getting new people coming in and contributing. So anybody wants to contribute, come to GitHub Containers, create your either open up issues, play with Podman, play with these tools. Tell me what you like and don't like. The biggest thing we are working on right now for pods is we, we feel that using Kubernetes, anybody, who's played with Kubernetes here? Okay, the people who play with Kubernetes, Kubernetes is very, in my opinion, is very difficult to work with because it starts with a YAML file. And you as a developer of software have to start editing that YAML file and define all that JSON type stuff inside of it. What we want to do with Podman is basically allow you to set up sort of three or four applications running inside of different pods, wire it all together with Podman, using sort of the same things you learned with doing Docker. And then we want to run a single command that says extract that to, pod, to uh, Kubernetes YAML. So if I run a, if I run a web service and MariaDB and um, you know, some kind of load balancing on my local host, and then do a Podman command extract, Podman kube extract, and give me a directory, I will generate the YAML files that you need. Now you can take those YAML files and end a, a script to execute it. And you execute the script and all of a sudden you're running the exact same environment inside of Kubernetes. And now you can go in with those YAML files and start to play with them and say, you know, I had one MariaDB running on my local host with Podman, I want three of them. And you can basically configure that. Or I want, you know, three web services. And now I can start to distribute my Kubernetes environment around, but start where, I mean, again, I'm a stupid guy, right? I need, to, I need to copy and paste, right? Most of my programming over the years is always looking up, you know, that's why everybody Googles, you know, there's, there's people in the NSA who don't have access to Google. I don't know how they work, <laughs> right? How do you figure out how to do anything, right? You say, how, did, how do you do this? And you Google and someone does, and you cut and paste, oh, that's how it works, and then you, you start expanding on it. So. What we want to do is basically build up with Podman to the point where you can generate Kubernetes stuff and then move it right into OpenShift. So that's sort of actually we're having meetings and discussing how we do that today. So those are some of the things we're, we're playing around with. And user namespace, really getting that turned on by default is also because user namespace has been this promise for years and years, and now we finally have stuff ready to to be able to use it. So okay, thanks. Thank you.